Hello, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm so excited that you are here joining us for our talk on surveillance. Dr. Harwell is with us and thank she you. is going to hopefully give you some peace and reassurance about your surveillance plan. I know it's a hot topic. So yes. many of our survivors, that's a big deal. You know, it's like, how come my friend is doing this and this is what I'm doing? How right. come I'm seeing my primary care? Why are you seeing your surgeon? Mm -hmm. You know, the fear is, is it back? So hopefully sure. you can give everybody some peace of mind tonight. And that is our goal for you. Before we get started, I just would like you to know that Dr. Harwell is going to speak a little bit um, and give us a PowerPoint. And you may submit your Q&A at any time. And at the end of her PowerPoint presentation, then I will ask her questions, ask your questions for her. So also, I want to thank all of our wonderful um, donators for our Project Paint survivors because this program and all the programs we do are free because of your generous support. So we really appreciate that. My name is Lori Buckley, and I am here with the energetic and bubbly Dr. <laughs> Harwell. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> she um, did her medical residency and school at the University of Kansas and then went on and did her multidisciplinary breast oncology fellowship at the University of Iowa. Mm -hmm. Go Hawks. And, and go Hawks. <laughs> Ooh, careful. <I> know. <laughs> <laughs> and so she is currently working with CHI Creighton and um, you will find her at the Lakeside location. So I'm just going to hand it over to Dr. Harwell and let her begin with her presentation. So well, thank I, you very much for joining us. We're thrilled to have you. I so appreciate it. It's such an honor to be here. And I think this, you're right, this is a huge topic for patients. Um, it's one thing, you know, when they get the diagnosis and they're like, okay, we got to start treatment. They go in like this. And then after we're like, okay, you're done with your treatment. And everybody is just still, yeah. like, they don't know what to do next. And mm -hmm. there's this kind of uncomfortable limbo. And I think that's really scary for patients. Um, and so I, I think kind of knowing what to expect and uh, from the provider side, what we're thinking about, I think might be a little bit helpful for everybody out there. So um, I just, cause what I have is this kind of very general and I wanted to make it more of a conversation. So please feel free to interject or um, you at home, please send your questions. Um, but this is just kind of a very kind of general overview of what we think of it from the provider perspective. That is exactly what you said happens all the time. You know, I see that my patients come in and they're like, you know, they can't wait for a treatment to be done, for treatment to be done. You're like, oh, they're counting the days, and then it's over with, yeah. and then they're like, oh, yeah. now I'm hanging. What am I supposed now to what? do? Now what? Yes. The now what thing is pretty scary. Yes. So. Yeah, that is that is almost a harder time as a provider when my patients come back and see me for their six month or their one year. They're just like waiting for something to happen. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I hate that for them because there, there's not a lot that I can do other than reassure them that everything is coming back normal and things like that. But it mm -hmm. just feels like a waiting game, especially that first year. Yeah. So um, so when you are all finished with your treatment, um, you know, as medical oncologists and surgical oncologists, we tend to follow our patients pretty closely, um, especially for the first five years. Um, and a lot of the recommendations are from the, the National Cancer Committee. Um, that's where we get most of our recommendations from. Um, and so we do recommend that you meet with a medical oncologist or your surgeon um, every three to six months, especially for the first five years. And essentially that's kind of just a check-in to see how things are going. You know, we're doing an exam, um, those kinds of things. And so, um, you know, when you come to see us, the things we wanna know is any lasting side effects from the treatment that you had. How are you feeling overall? Um, any side effects with the meds that you're currently taking? Um, any new symptoms? Um, as the surgeon, I wanna know how you feel about the way you look and how you feel about the way you can move around and interact and, you know, cause it's a huge change to your body after you've had surgery mm -hmm. for breast cancer. Um, so those are the kind of things that, you know, we're as providers wanting to know. Um, and we check in pretty frequently, for, like I said, for those first five years. Um, then, you know, when we talk about more specific things for patients, you know, not all of our patients had chemotherapy, um, but those that did, um, especially if you had something called adriamycin or um, Herceptin and Progetta, we worry about the heart side effects with those medications. Um, and so you probably got an echocardiogram or a heart ultrasound during your treatment. Um, and that's the kind of thing that can have some lasting side effects. Um, so your medical oncologist will most likely recommend that you have another um, echocardiogram or heart ultrasound at least a year or so after treatment to make sure everything is still at baseline for you. And that's pretty much becoming the norm mm -hmm. to do that on mm -hmm. a regular basis? Yeah, just for, for those who've taken those specific chemotherapies. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not for everybody, but something for those people. 
Um, and, I, and I know that not everybody had chemotherapy. Fortunately, you know, not, not all breast cancer patients need that. Um, but if you didn't get chemotherapy, then chances are you probably are on an anti-estrogen medicine. Um, and so when we talk about surveillance on women with anti-estrogens, there's kind of two different categories that we think about. Uh, so tamoxifen is typically for our premenopausal women. Mm -hmm. um, and there are certain side effects and, and things that can come along with tamoxifen. And so it's really important to get very routine gynecologic exams um, when you're on tamoxifen and report any abnormal uterine bleeding immediately to your provider because that can be something very concerning. Um, and so that's something that we're constantly watching with patients who are on tamoxifen. Um, if you were not on tamoxifen, but you had hormone positive breast cancer, then you're probably on another kind of medication called an aromatase inhibitor. Um, those are things like Arimidex, Anastrozole, Letrozole, Eximestane, um, Riloxifene, or Avista. Those are all medications that fall in that category. Um, and those tend to be our postmenopausal women that take those meds. Um, and there's lots of really fun side effects, unfortunately, that come with those meds, like joint pains and hot flashes and things like that. Um, but the thing that we worry about as providers is bone loss. Um, you can get some pretty significant bone loss with those meds. Um, so prior to starting, um, most of you should have had a DEXA scan or a bone density test. Um, and that's just kind of gives us a baseline. And then that's checked every two to three years. Um, usually medical oncology um, will check that because they're the ones prescribing the medicine. Um, and so it's just to make sure that you're not having any bone loss or if we are, we start replacing it with calcium and vitamin D um, or even some kind of heavier drugs sometimes we need to help um, replenish that bone loss that comes with those medications. Do you guys test then um, like their minerals and vitamins in their blood system as well just to make sure that they're... We do. Um, calcium and vitamin D especially are very important to decrease the risk of breast cancer recurrence. Um, and so vitamin D levels are checked pretty routinely um, as part of the lab work that patients get. Oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that kind of also falls in with the aromatase inhibitors. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that moves right into lab, very good. Uh, so, <laughs> exactly. Um, so especially for patients who had chemo, um, when they start to come off those medicines, we want to make sure their blood levels are bouncing back as far as their white blood cell count, their hemoglobin, platelets, things like that. Um, we're also looking at electrolytes um, like calcium and uh, magnesium, sodium, potassium, those things can all get out of whack, you know, when we're going through treatment. Um, so those labs are pretty routinely followed for the first few months, um, especially at, after treatment, but well into the first five years of, of um, after treatment. We're also looking at liver and kidney function, and we talked about the vitamin D. Mm -hmm. um, a new, a kind of newer test um, in the arena for breast cancer is something called Signatera. Um, and that's been very exciting, um, especially for triple negative breast cancer. Um, it is a, so when you are first diagnosed, um, your tumor is sent for DNA testing. And obviously the tumor's DNA is different than your DNA. Um, and so the, your blood is checked every so often. I believe they do it initially during treatment every month and then every few months when you're finished with treatment to see if they see any of that circulating tumor DNA in your bloodstream. Um, when patients go through treatment, you know, it starts very high and then as they go through, it gets down to zero essentially when they're through their treatment. And then in the surveillance phase, it's something that we check periodically to make sure we don't see those numbers rising, that there's a concern for recurrence before we would see something on imaging or on exam or something like that. That was one of the questions somebody had when they registered had put in. Mm -hmm. um, they were wondering about the blood test versus imaging mm -hmm. for monitoring cancer for surveillance afterwards? Yeah, the, the sort of, I would say, downside to Signatera is um, it really has so far only been very beneficial for our triple negative breast cancer patients um, because the, the, that tumor tends to be more aggressive and so it shows up in the blood faster than the other kinds of cancers. Um, so um, I still think that medical oncologists are drawing that, med that, um, that test for different kinds. We just haven't seen the, the great results as we have with um, with the triple negatives. So imaging is still the gold standard, certainly. Um, we still do imaging surveillance um, for breast cancer, but the Signatera is something that is relatively new and I think has a lot of promise. It just, it's just not quite there yet. So, but some, um, some patients might know that their medical oncologists are watching that for them. Um, the Vidisa, is it, am, I, am I pronouncing that right? V-I-D-E-S-S-A? -S oh, uh-huh. Is that how you pronounce that one? Mm -hmm. What is that test? So um, there's um, a couple of different uh, tests that kind of fall into that category. So um, there are tumor markers um, that we think of as um, high risk for breast cancer. Those are not very specific. We still draw those. Um, and then um, the Signatera and the Vedessa are very similar. They work on circulating okay. tumor DNA. 
Um, and then um, I can't think of another test that would be necessarily like a blood test that we would follow. Unfortunately, we're just, we're not quite there yet. Okay. Yeah, that's what one of the survivors said was wondering if, you know, those kind of tests would work instead of doing the imaging scans. I know. They don't always, unfortunately. I think um, it's evolved a lot, and I'm hoping that it will in the future, um, but it just hasn't quite panned out for all the types of breast we, cancer yet. nice to get there. Yes, exactly. And we hope. will. We will. Yeah. 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 So, um, so surveillance after surgery, so obviously this is very important to me. Um, you know, I, I hate when my patients come back and they're unhappy with the way things look or they weren't expecting that something would be different. And so um, I, I hopefully, and most of your surgeons should do a lot of um, pre-op expectation of kind of what it's like. You know, we do what we can to make you still look like you and feel like you, but it's just always going to be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes managing those symptoms is an important part of the surveillance. What's normal and what's not normal? Like, is it normal to have shooting pains throughout the breast? Absolutely. That is not a sign of recurrence, but that scares a lot of patients. Mm -hmm. um, but just kind of the, going through those kinds of expectations, like what's normal, what's not. Um, so what is your pain like? Is it manageable? You know, is it something that we need to deal with? Um, and then how do you feel about the way that you look? Do you need a symmetry procedure? If you just had a lumpectomy and radiation, do we need something to make you more balanced, like a reduction on the other side, um, that kind of thing? Um, and then, of course, lymphedema is the big thing, especially as a surgeon that I, um, that I dread for my patients. You know, we've come a long way in terms of, like, arm lymphedema mm -hmm. and the symptoms for that. You know, we only take a few lymph nodes. We have wonderful occupational therapists that work with us. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the, the rates of lymphedema of the arm are down quite a bit. Um, but the, I think the thing that's not talked about as much is breast lymphedema, mm -hmm. um, and that affects a, a significant number of women. Um, and truthfully, if you've had surgery and you've had radiation, breast lymphedema, at least to some extent, is probably going to be part of the package. Um, and just knowing what to look for and that patients know that it doesn't have to be like this. There's things we can do about it um, and that it's not a sign of the cancer coming back. It's more mm -hmm. of a sign of the treatment that they've had. So at, the, at your surgery visits, that should be something that the surgeon brings up with you. Um, and so imaging surveillance. This is always the thing that everybody, all of my patients are so nervous for that first image after yeah, surgery. It's a scary day. It is, absolutely. Because the last time they went for a mammogram, they got some really bad news. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the kind of imaging surveillance we do really depends on the kind of surgery that you had. Um, so for my lumpectomy patients, so the patients who um, kept most of their breast and obviously still have the, the other breast, um, your first mammogram is considered a diagnostic mammogram, and that just means that they take extra pictures. We just want to look at that breast very closely and get sort of a new baseline um, because that breast is different looking now on imaging, and we want to know what the new normal is. Mm -hmm. um, so we typically do not recommend getting any breast imaging for at least six months after you finish radiation. Um, I tell my patients that it looks like a hot mess in there because there's lots of healing that's happening um, and it's, yeah. and it's you, no recurrence is going to happen in that time period. And so we just need everything to kind of calm down and heal. Um, and then we'll get that mammogram about six months or so after we finish radiation. Um, so six months after radiation, mammogram is still the gold standard um, and we still do that once a year. There are no official recommendations for MRI, however... Um, for some of my patients, I will add surveillance MRI into their imaging surveillance with the mammogram. So everybody's got to get a mammogram. You just have to. That's, got, that's our gold standard. You have to get a mammogram. But for our patients who, um, who maybe their cancer wasn't found on their mammogram, you know, they felt a lump and they had a mammogram and their mammogram was normal, mm -hmm. I don't feel super comfortable following them with mammogram. And the patients don't feel comfortable either. Right. right. Um, so MRI is part of their surveillance, absolutely. Um, patients with lobular cancer, we know that lobular is not that well seen on mammogram, um, and MRI is really the gold standard test for that. So my lobular patients are getting um, MRI surveillance as well. Um, women with very dense breasts that just have a difficult to read mammogram, those women need MRI surveillance too. Um, so even though there's no specific recommendation for MRI, you know, the point I think of breast cancer treatment is that it is individualized. and so. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes my patients are like, so-and-so is happening to my friend. And I said, and that's probably the right thing for your friend, but everybody's journey is different and trust your care team. We know what we're talking about. Yeah. 
Um, so, so the MRI thing is not routinely recommended, but if your physician is recommending it, I promise we have a good reason. Um, and, and if they're not, then there's also a good reason for that too. Yeah. It's nice to know that about the lobular because, you know, yeah. that's a clear difference. Absolutely. You know, because people aren't just thinking, oh, she had one, so I need one too. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yes. A scare thing. Yes, exactly. So. Yeah. Great point. Um, so those are for my lumpectomy patients. Obviously, they still have breast tissue, so they still need to be imaged um, with mammogram or MRI. Um, but then mastectomy is kind of a different thing. Um, so my, for my patients who have mastectomy, I always make sure that they know it is still possible to get a recurrence um, after mastectomy, although it's extremely unlikely. Um, but because of that, we still have to watch them very closely. Um, so if they still have one breast, if they just had one mastectomy, then obviously that breast still needs annual mammograms, just like we would if you were a lumpectomy patient. Um, if you went double and are completely flat, so no reconstruction, um, you still need a chest wall exam. Um, and so for my patients, I do every six months a uh, chest wall exam, and that's essentially, literally, I am your new mammogram. My hands are going to feel if something is wrong. So things that I tell my patients to look for, um, any skin changes along the scar, any bumps along the scar, any bumps under the arms. Um, you know, when we think about a recurrence after a mastectomy, they look like little bug bites that don't go away. And that's what I tell my patients. If you see something like that, that's a phone call to me. And that's the stuff that I'm looking for when they come to see me. Um, and then of course, if we are worried about something, you can always, we would get an MRI to follow up on that. But mostly it's just a really experienced person doing a really good exam. Um, for my bilateral, so my double that have had implant-based reconstruction, there's again no mammograms, um, and um, we don't do necessarily yearly MRIs, um, but the FDA has recommended that anybody with implants undergo MRI surveillance of the implant um, at three years after placement, and mm -hmm. then every two years after that. So we will get MRIs to check the implant, and if we're going to check the implant, we might as well just check everything. So I just get an MRI of the breast and the implant as well for those patients. Um, and then lastly, me, my patients who um, have had um, bilateral mastectomies and then had a tissue reconstruction, so like a deep flap or another kind of muscle flap, mm -hmm. um, there is again no specific imaging recommendation for those patients. And um, it's, it's kind of a complicated reconstruction, and so I highly recommend those patients see someone who's very qualified to do a really good physical exam twice a year. So myself, a medical oncologist, you know, their plastic surgeon potentially, someone like that. Because um, it's just it's just different when you've had something like that. Not mm -hmm. everybody knows what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So, and then of course, if there's an issue, MRI is kind of the next step. Recommend. Here's a question. <laughs> Recommendation for stage zero had DMX nothing in um, lymph nodes. What follow up and when? DMX like by double mastectomy. Double mastectomy sorry. Um, so uh, same thing. Those patients. I mean, even a stage zero, they're still they're still breast cancer patients, so they get followed the same way. So really good physical exam. Um, usually if you had stage zero breast cancer, you probably didn't get any other treatment. You're not on any medication, you didn't get radiation. Um, and so, you know, those patients who aren't getting medical treatment or radiation treatment, they're mine. They're like, surveillance. They gotta come, yeah, they, yeah, gotta, they gotta come, come back to, to me and, yeah. and really yeah. follow with somebody who knows what they're looking for. Yeah. Um, and same thing if they had implants, they fall into that MRI category for the implants. And if they've had tissue reconstruction, they follow into that category. But those patients certainly need to stick with their surgeon. Mm -hmm. Very good Great question. question. Yes. Um, one of the, can you explain a little bit the different types, what the different imaging are? Because that seems very confusing for it. I had several questions about that. The like, PET scan versus the MRI yeah. versus. Yeah. Um, so everybody knows what a mammogram is because that's how everybody got here probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so of course there's a mammogram. Ultrasound um, is typically reserved if we see something concerning on imaging or if we feel something, they'll do an ultrasound because it's just very targeted. Um, MRI is, um, for those of you who didn't do an MRI, um, you're, you're laying on your tummy like this and your breasts fall through some cups. And it's um, kind of like getting a CT scan um, in the fact that it gives a 3D image of the breast. Um, but it also looks at the lymph nodes, it looks at both breasts, it gets some of your chest. Um, as a surgeon, I use MRI um, preoperatively to help me plan for surgery for patients. Um, and then we use it, of course, in surveillance for certain patients. Um, but that's typically just really looking at the breast and the lymph nodes. It doesn't really give us much of a look at anything else. Um, PET scan. Um, so uh, PET scan relies on um, sugar. So we know that certain cells take up more sugar like cancer cells, um, inflammatory cells, things like that. 
And so patients will get an injection of a certain kind of glucose um, through their IV, and then they do a full body scan, typically at school to the knees. Um, and it just, uh, anything that's very, um, that's working a lot with sugar um, will light up very bright on the PET scan. And so some things we know are gonna light up and we know it's not cancer, it's just the way that the, that physiology is of that body. Um, but if something lights up very bright, then it makes us concerned, like what's going on here? Are we worried about some mm -hmm. kind of cancer forming here? Um, and that's what a PET scan is for. Um, so for surveillance, um, PET is usually reserved for patients who have disease elsewhere, so our stage four patients um, that we're watching to see what's happening with a medication that they're on. Um, and they'll get PET scans typically every three to six months um, to make sure the medicine is still working and that we don't see any new sites of metastatic disease or cancer pop up elsewhere. So one of the questions that um, we had earlier was about, so if you end up having bone lesions, mm -hmm. um, METs to the bone, and they're located in one particular area because mm -hmm. they had a pain and they found out yes. it was just right here. Right. Um, so then just, would that qualify for an entire bone scan? Yes, mm -hmm. typically. An entire body bone scan mm -hmm. should be followed by that. Yes, That was a exactly. question that somebody had submitted. Yes, okay. so once we find an area of um, cancer elsewhere, that should prompt whole body imaging because if it's here, is Could it somewhere so else? Well. Exactly, we need to know if it's somewhere else. So that should prompt um, you know, scans of the chest and the abdomen and then all the bones as well. Mm -hmm. And when they find that it's spread to an organ, then they should have a full body PET scan? Um, so typically, yes. Um, that's kind of a decision that the medical oncologist makes. Um, if, it's, if it's disease that can be seen with a CT scan or a bone scan, they may not necessarily get a PET scan. Um, but more often than not, I would say to follow, um, especially if they're undergoing active treatment, PET is just very sensitive. And so that's what most of my medical oncologists will use. Um, so that brings us into the rest of the imaging surveillance. Um, so for my stage one through stage three patients um, who don't have any signs of disease elsewhere, we don't typically recommend um, full body scanning. So we don't do CT scans or bone scans routinely, unless of course you have a concern, so the pain here or something like that, then that'll prompt imaging. Um, otherwise, if we think that your disease was localized here and you were treated for cure, um, then we don't typically do you know, scans looking for things. Um, of course, my metastatic patients are different because we're following um, lesions and things like that for treatment. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we don't typically order whole body imaging unless there's a concern from the patient. So, um, and then for my metastatic patients, um, we will do you know, the, the tumor markers, so the Signatera test or, um, or other tumor marker tests, and then imaging, watching whatever, wherever we know the disease is to make sure that it's responding to the treatment. Um, so symptoms, so this is what leads us to image sometimes. Um, so these are the things that you know, I, I think sometimes women don't know what is concerning for cancer elsewhere and what's necessarily, um, you know, everyone thinks the breast cancer is here, but obviously it can go elsewhere. Um, so things that we would want to know, um, you know, any skin changes along the breast. We talked about lymphedema is very um, normal, can be very normal after you've had surgery, but there's other skin changes that are not normal and that are, you know, concerning. And for my, you know, what I tell my patients is, if you're not sure if it's normal or not normal, then just call me, because I can tell you if it is or not, okay? And if patients have to call me every day for a month to know that their skin change is, not, is normal, then that's okay. Because um, I don't, what I don't want them to think is, oh, this is probably just that thing she was talking about, and then it turns out it was something else. Mm -hmm. um, so skin change certainly, general feelings like fatigue, hot flashes, um, that's going to happen on some of those medicines. But you know, there are things that we can do. There's other things that we can help with the symptoms or potentially switch to a different med. So we want to know if you're having those kinds of side effects, um, mood changes. That's pretty common with tamoxifen. Um, but again. If we need to change something so that the quality of life is still there, you know, we have to know. Patients need to talk to us about that. Um, joint pain happens with those aromatase inhibitors. Mm -hmm. um, but again, there's stuff we can do about it and things we can change. If, but if we don't know, we can't help. Um, the things that are concerning for cancer elsewhere, bone pain. Okay? Can't, breast cancer goes to the bones. That's one of its unfortunately favorite spots. So if you're having hip pain, back pain, shoulder pain, any kind of pain, most likely, it's probably arthritis, we hope, but you gotta let us know so that we can look into it and make sure that's all that it is. Okay, so we gotta know about bone pain. Um, headaches, dizziness, any kind of vision change. Um, it's unusual, but breast cancer can go to the brain and we wanna know about that too. So any kind of changes like that, we would need to know about. Um, 
muscle pain, cough, it can go to the lungs, so shortness of breath, cough, chest pain. Um, it can go to the liver, so abdominal pain or um, yellowing of the skin, that kind of stuff. Um, those are things that you need to bring up to your physician because that would clue us in that we need to be looking at some things very closely. Um, and then my patients always want to know what I want to do absolutely every single thing I possibly can do to make sure that this doesn't come back. Um, and most of you guys are doing it. I mean, they're mm -hmm. watching themselves very closely. They're taking their meds. They're following with their physicians. They're doing the things that they need to do. Um, what I always talk to my patients is don't smoke for so many reasons, but especially for your breasts, don't smoke. If you can quit smoking, that's huge. Um, same thing with alcohol. Alcohol has been shown to increase the risk of recurrence, and so as much as patients can limit that, um, it's very beneficial. Um, maintaining a healthy body weight. Of course, um, you know, our fat cells make estrogen, and for those women who had hormonal um, breast cancer, that's a big deal. So as much as you can maintain a healthy body weight, it's very important for the, uh, decreasing the risk of recurrence. Mm -hmm. um, and then activity, of course, goes in with the, the healthy body weight. Mm -hmm. So. I think that was all the major stuff that I had to talk about. Um, so I'm more interested in what the it didn't go over. Yes, that okay. people want to know. <laughs> we'll see. Um, let's see. Um, some of these questions you've had. I have a daughter. What are the guidelines when to start her for precautionary surveillance? Sure. I'm um, assuming that's somebody who's genetic. Yes. So um, every breast cancer um, patient should have genetic testing. Um, if you haven't, you should definitely talk to your provider because you would qualify certainly. Um, if you had genetic testing that was negative um, and you have a breast cancer diagnosis, it kind of depends, depends on the family history and about the daughter. Um, but we typically say um, with negative genetics, it's 10 years before the youngest person diagnosed. So if a mother was diagnosed at 40, her daughter starts surveillance at 30. Hmm. And if you're not sure, just have come see me. <laughs> So how long after treatments are completed do I still need to see my oncologist and have surveillance? So um, I think oncologists tend to hold on to their patients a little bit longer um, than I think the average bear, um, which is good. You know, I think a medical oncologist should mm -hmm. be like that. Um, you know, the first five years is kind of our, our biggest kind of push to see you very frequently, make sure you're doing okay from the treatment. Um, and then after that, most medical oncologists will see their patients once or twice a year. Um, for as long as the patient will, essentially. Um, and that's what I do for my patients too. Come back and see me whenever you want for as long as you want. Is there any extra surveillance needed for survivors who have implants to make sure they haven't moved or they're not leaking? Or? Yeah, so that's what the, the MRI um, would be for. So for patients who have implants, um, three years after um, placement, certainly an MRI. Um, and then the shifting is something that the patient and the surgeon will see on the outside, certainly. And that, that can be very normal. I mean, gravity and, mm -hmm. you know, none of us are immune to that, unfortunately. Um, so that can happen. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean anything bad, but, you know, maybe they need a revision or something like that. Um, but the MRI will be the thing that would show any kind of leakage. Let's see. Um. My surveillance plan wasn't communicated to me. Who should I talk to and who should be doing that for me? Um, you know, I think traditionally speaking, the medical oncologist is usually the one um, because they're monitoring any kind of meds that you were taking. Um, I will say, um, you know, for uh, breast surgeons, we tend to be a little bit protective of our patients as well. Um, and so if the surgeon didn't go over it with you, um, that would be another person to ask. Um, but certainly the medical oncologist, especially if they're following a med or, you know, something like that. I no longer see my oncologist or go in for mammograms or MRIs, and I'm worried I'm no longer under a watchful eye. Should I be doing something on my own for surveillance? Uh, so definitely, if you still have your breasts, you need a mammogram every single year. You just do. Um, and somebody needs to do an exam. I mean, we all need exams, um, whether it's by you know your primary care or your medical oncologist or your surgeon. Um, certainly, somebody needs to be following that. Yeah. Yep. You have to just ask somebody else. Yeah. Um, I had a mastectomy with reconstruction. Oh, we already talked about the mammograms. Some of my co-survivors are getting MRIs once a year as part of their su surveillance. Should I be talking to my doctor about that? I think that's a fair question. Mm -hmm. um, 
So uh, sometimes, especially if patients that had a lot of disease or a very close margin at surgery, will be more apt to do um, MRI screening once a year for those patients. Um, for patients who had like a very small cancer and very widely negative margins and other low risk features, we're less concerned about something like that on MRI. Um, but you know, everybody, like I said, everything is individualized and I don't think it's wrong to ask your provider if an MRI is a good idea for you. Um, I, you know, this is the same thing that I tell my kids. I have a reason for everything that I do and you should always be able to ask and I should always give you a really good response. <laughs> and if not, then you should question it. So I never, it never bothers me when patients ask me things like that. Does the MR, MRI referral come from a surgeon or the oncologist? It can be either. Um, either can order an MRI, certainly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think about thermograms or thermography mm -hmm. in general in place of a PET scan? Uh, um, I'm t thinking by the look on your face, <laughs> that's not your favorite thing. <laughs> not my favorite thing. Um, I, I love the idea of it. It's just the science has not panned out. Um, it's just not nearly as good of a test. Um, you know, people want to use it in place of um, MRI and mammogram, and they want to use it in place of PET, and it's just, it's not equivalent. So I, I, I want it to be there, but it's just not yet. Um, there are, thank you, answered that already, talking about the cancer marker blood test. There's questions about that and, you know, how do they work? Um, let's see. I had radiation. How long after radiation do I need to cont continue seeing the radiation oncologist? Um, I absolutely love my radiation oncologist, but they are kind of like a you're done, we're high five and you out the door kind of situation. Um, and so, you know, they'll typically see their patients uh, about a month or so after they finish treatment just to make sure everything is healing appropriately. And I would be surprised if anyone saw their radiation oncologist after that. Um, and that's okay because that's what the surgeon is for. We watch for things like that. When they start getting the radiation fibrosis and the tightness and that, um, who do they go to for that then afterwards? Do they follow up with? So I, I that to me falls in, under the surgical um, that's umbrella. Still on the mm -hmm. surgical umbrella. Yeah. So he really is. The radiation is when you're done, you're done. I mean, that's that's how it that's tends how it to gets. be. Yes. I mean, obviously, if I needed something or if I was concerned about something, I would have no hesitation to send my patient back to a radiation oncologist. Um, but they tend to focus more during the treatment phase, and then surveillance is really with the surgeon and the on medical oncologist. And then um, I think that's most of our questions. Oh. I was sent for my first mammogram since diagnosis only four months out from radiation. Should I be concerned that it wasn't at least six months out? Hey, she was listening. <laughs> she was listening. Good for you. I have um, lymph and worried about... Lymphedema, I couldn't say that. I have lymphedema and I'm worried... That altered it? Mm -hmm. um, so... The radiation po possibly altered it? Or the MRI. Yeah, so a mammogram, uh, getting the you know getting a mammogram isn't going to make lymphedema worse by any means. Um, that's more of an like a thing that happens inside the tissues itself from mm -hmm. the radiation and surgery. Um, and I don't think you know four months is that's okay. It just makes it difficult to read your mammogram. But if you had a really great breast radiologist, then they probably thought it was just fine. Um, we typically say six months just because it makes it the imaging easier and it usually. It's a little bit less painful. I don't know how painful that was uh, four months out, but mm -hmm. um, but it definitely didn't hurt anything. I mean, the breast is well healed, and it's not going to make any lymphedema worse. I, I don't. I agree. It wouldn't make that lymphedema any worse. And the four months out could also depend on how severe, how much radiation they had. Exactly. You know, maybe they didn't have as much, and so right. it might not have altered the MRI at all. That's true. If it was yes. just like a shorter that, course or something like that. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, do we have any other questions? We're good. Do you have any other insights that you would like to give us? Oh, that's so broad. <laughs> I know, isn't it? <laughs> and one of the questions, and, and I think this is just surveillance in general, but was how do I know my treatments are working and have worked? And that's just oh, the constant surveillance, right? I know. That is the hardest piece of it. Yeah. I, you know, when my, I really, I love to see my patients at the year out mark because they look like, you know, totally Different new people. different people, yes. Yeah. And like from my standpoint, I'm like, yay, you look like a different person. And then from yeah. their standpoint, they're like, oh my gosh, I'm a different person, you yeah. know. I think that that aspect of it um, for the surveillance part is so hard. And it's not the thing that's talked about. 
because, you know, from the provider standpoint, we're like, you did it, yeah. you did it, yeah. you know. Yeah. But my patients are like, I don't feel like me. I have a different identity. Mm -hmm. I lost this or I lost that. And yeah. um, and I hate that part of it. But they ha we you have to talk to us about that because we have to be able to talk to other patients about it or know if you need resources or mm -hmm. things like that. Um, so that, that to me is the harder part of surveillance is just, it's just surveillance. We just watch, you know, mm -hmm. there's nothing left to do necessarily. You know, the interesting thing is, um, is that that year or six months or five year, whatever, all those times they come back for the, they're scared each and every time. I know. But each and every time they look more beautiful and they look more whole. Yes. And they walk in the door and you're like, oh, it's so <laughs> nice to see you. I hardly yeah. recognized you. Your hair looks so great. Yeah, exactly. You know, and you have this joy in your heart because yes. they walked in and they look so good to you. Yeah. And they walk in going, you know, I know, because they're thinking it's just a scary day for them. I know. So it's like I, too complete. Like it's the scariest day in the world for you. But for us, we're like, oh, I love Yay, it. Yay, we get to see you today. You're still here. That's beautiful. We love it. I know. Absolutely. I know. When I look at my schedule plate, I'm like, oh, good. She's coming back. Oh, good. She's coming back. And then I know. And then from their perspective, they're like, oh, I got to go see oh, Dr. God. Hartwell. <laughs> like, what's she going to find? Yeah. Whereas I'm just like, you look great. You know, I'm yeah. like so excited to see them. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's a completely different perspective. That's because we actually get what you went through and we get how strong you are. Yes. And it's just, you know, you have a beautiful smile and Absolutely. we're just excited that you're here. Yep. We know it was a struggle and you gave a lot to get there, but we're yeah. super excited to see them. Exactly, so happy super for Super excited. Yeah. And sometimes I don't recognize people. I'm like, I, oh, is that your real hair? I'm, like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I didn't know you were Dr. Hartwell. Yeah. Didn't recognize you with that beautiful hair. <laughs> it no, could I be a wig or whatever. Yes, exactly. Coming with a baseball yeah. hat, so it's just beautiful to see you. Is the PET scan good with lobby, lobular it's, cancer? PET is not great with lobular. Um, it, it, I guess it depends. Um, lobular is just a much sneakier kind of cancer in the way that it spreads. Um, it also doesn't tend to be as um, aggressive. The cells are not as aggressive looking, and so sometimes they don't take up that sugar. Um, that being said, we still see lobular cancer on PET scans, so it's not like it's a, it's a terrible test, um, but it usually has to be a certain size or in a certain location for us to see it on the PET. So the best surveillance for lobular, again, can you just reassure what that would be? So if you still have your breast, um, MRI absolutely is the best surveillance. Um, mammogram is, again, still the gold standard. Um, and then if you, have, if you already have metastatic disease with lobular that was seen on some sort of imaging, then obviously they'll follow with that kind of imaging. Um, and then, of course, if you have a symptom, then the imaging should pick up if there's something there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As someone with dense tissue whose cancer wasn't found on their MRI, would it be good for every, um, every other year to do an MRI? Um, you, you certainly can. Every other year is probably not going to hurt anything. Um, you know, I feel like my patients who it wasn't seen on mammogram um, because of their dense breasts, um, if, especially if they kept their breast and they've had treatment in that breast, um, it, I would do a yearly MRI. I think it would make us both feel a little bit better. I mean, it would just be like your yearly mammogram. But then as you get further out from treatment and the breast tissue becomes less dense because the older we get and our hormones change, then every other year might be very appropriate. And is there any issue with the surveillance of doing the different tests with insurance coverage? Yeah, sometimes there can be. Um, there, there are ways to uh, work around that sometimes. And typically, if you had a cancer that was not seen on mammogram, that really should not be an issue with insurance um, as long as you're, um, it's documented appropriately. Um, but that is a problem that we sometimes run into is insurance does not necessarily want to pay for an MRI. Um, but if you have a really good surgeon or oncologist, we find ways to document appropriately. Mm -hmm. Creative writing? That's right. Okay. Creative but truthful. So, <laughs> stage zero double mastectomy with no lymph node involved. What should I be moving forward? Um, so if, you, um, if you've had double mastectomies for stage zero, probably no, like I said, no medical treatment, so no medicines um, and no radiation for something like that. Um, so really your treatment was purely surgical. And so you need to be following with your surgeon at least once a year, even twice a year for a really good exam. Um, and then, of course, if there's implants, you need MRI surveillance, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think we have another question coming here. 19 years post, do I still need any sort of surveillance other than my yearly mammogram? Congratulations for one thing. That's awesome. 
um, 19 years post and yet you still, you know, it's still with you. And oh, that makes me, that, that hurts my heart a little bit. Um, but a yearly mammogram is the perfect surveillance. A yearly mammogram and, and a, a yearly exam with somebody qualified as great surveillance for that. How often do I get genetic testing done? Um, so it depends on the, the test that you had and when you had it done. So most of us are doing panel testing, meaning they, they test for a bunch of different genes. Um, and it depends on when you had your testing done, but I would say every five years it'd be good to revisit it just because new mutations come about, new things mm -hmm. like that. And so some of my patients um, were like, well, I had genetic testing done in 2009. I'm like, oh, girl, that's a whole lifetime ago. We got to get you updated. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say roughly every five years would be a good time. Or if you know you have new, um, new cancers in the family, that might change things as well. So mm -hmm. new family history that's come up. Very good. Is that all of our questions for the evening? Great. You did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate yeah. it. Well, I can tell you're very passionate about what you do. Absolutely. So. Yeah, it's yes. just very important. So that's awesome. Well, thank you all for joining in. We really appreciate it. Um, please look at our projectpink.org website for upcoming events because we have lots of exciting things planned for you here in 2023. So we're looking forward to it. Thank you again. You can find Dr. Harwell at Lakeside CHI. Thank you so much.